Hello there, my name is Leaf and I've got another Godot tutorial for you guys today. I'll be talking about advanced exports and tool scripts. By utilizing these two Godot features, we can craft a more useful inspector that suits our needs and allows for substantially less cluttered scene trees. So here I've got three different enemies, a slime, bat, and fire skull. Each utilizes the same component nodes, but behaves differently. Going to the editor, you can see that only the animation controller out of all the component nodes has editable children. Going over to the inspector, I can update things like shapes for area 2Ds and even see them in the scene view. The inspector will also automatically update when I change values, such as changing the attack type from ranged to melee, which changes the resource from projectile to hitbox so that I can update the relevant inputs. A quick note before we dive in, I'll be posting a Godot project on GitHub and linking it in the description. This project will contain examples like I'll be showing in this video, along with descriptive comments to help those that prefer to go through the code directly rather than through a video. And if you have any further questions or comments, please let me know, either here on YouTube or on the studio's Discord. I'll quickly talk about basic exporting. It's covered pretty well in the documentation, so I won't dwell on it. With basic exporting, we can add things like categories to the inspector, as well as variables such as strings and colors. We can also add groups and subgroups, as well as more complicated variables such as bit flags and nested arrays. Using basic exports alone, however, limits the usefulness of the inspector. The inspector and editor are not dynamic and are limited in the feedback they can offer us. Okay, first let's recreate what we had in the basic export scene using advanced exports, then we'll expand on it. By adding the at tool line to the top of the script, it allows that script to be run in the editor. Then we add the get property list function. This is called by the editor and is used to populate the inspector. The output of this function needs to be an array of dictionaries, and these dictionaries contain the information the editor needs to determine what is displayed. A string key of name with an associated string value represents the variable's name. Here we'll type in team name, a key of type lets the editor know what type of variant it is via bit flag. Here we'll use a type of string. And finally, a key of usage with another associated bit flag will specify the usage type of the variant. For most variables, they will have the usage of default. Now we can go over to the editor and see the team name string has been added to the inspector, but it doesn't update when we try to type something. That's because what's added in the getPropertyList function simply adds it to the inspector, but we need a real variable to store anything. The variable name must match the name given in the dictionary, so for this variable it will be team name. We can go back to the inspector now and see that we can properly update the variable. Uh, let's call the team name red. Now let's add the team color variable that we had before using the same methodology. The only difference will be the type will be color rather than string. We can now add the team category that we had before. Because a category isn't actually a variant that the script uses, its type is nil, and the usage bit flag is set to category. We also have to create a new dictionary key of hint string. A hint string gives the inspector more information on what to display. I'll go into more examples in a moment, but for categories and groups and subgroups, we need the hint string to match the beginning of the preceding variables in order for them to be captured. Here, we have the hint string of team so that the team name and team color already fit the structure we need. Now we have the category in the inspector with the team name and color inside of it and we can update the team name if we wanted to, or the color. Adding nested groups and subgroups can involve some weird syntax, so let's go over some examples here. I'll add another category, two groups, and a subgroup. Their usage values need to be updated to group or subgroup respectively. After we choose a new name for the first group, we have to update its hint string so that the previous category's hint string prefixes the new one. So, essentially, the hint strings and variable names will build upon previous categories in order to be properly nested. 
In this example, the groups and variables inside of the NPC info category must have the string NPC prefixing either their hint string or the variable name. The subgroup wizard spell must contain NPC and extra prefixing its hint string. As we saw when we were adding team name and team color, variables follow that same naming prefix convention. Let's add a few more variables now, making sure to match the types properly as well. Going over to check the inspector, we can see the variables inside of the groups and subgroup as we expected. We can notice though that our integer variable, attack power, has carrots to increment it, but the float value for health does not. If we want to add a slider with a range, we can introduce the final dictionary key of hint and its associated bit flag values. This dictionary key typically pairs with the hint string to provide the inspector with additional information. In this case, we have a hint key of range and a hint string that specifies a minimum of 1, maximum of 50, increment of 0.5, and an additional parameter of or greater. This limits the slider from 1 to 50, but a manually inputted value can go above our maximum, but not below our minimum. Going back to the inspector, we see the slider has been added and allows us to easily update our health float value within the parameters we gave even limiting the value when I try to manually type in a negative number. Now let's add the last two variables, the potions bag nested array and the trained classes integer. These variable types, arrays and bit flag integers, are a bit more complex to implement than others. For the trained classes, we will create an enum and specify the bits to flip so that the wizard class is equal to two, warrior four, and thief eight. We'll also create the enum for the different potions types now, with health, stamina, and mana. When adding the trained classes integer, we will need a hint value of hint flags and a special type of hint string in order to automatically populate the variable with our enum. Going back up to the variables, first we need to get the keys of our enum, and then join that array together into a single string with each of the keys separated by a comma. This basically just creates a list of all the values from the enum we created. We'll do the same thing for our potion types enum, as we will need a list of that as well. The classes list can then be used in our properties dictionary in the hint string for that variable. For the potions bag, we want a two-dimensional array with the inner values as integers represented by the potion types enum we created. The hint needs to be of type string. The syntax for hint string value can be challenging to understand, so I'll do my best to explain it thoroughly. As well, the Godot documentation has some more examples if you need them. The overall syntax is that the hint string needs to have percentage Ds with either trailing colons or forward slashes. Each of the Ds pairs with either a type or hint designation in the following array. A forward slash is only used instead of a trailing colon when you have a property hint to pair with a type. A percentage sign is placed in between the array and the string. In our example here, the first D pairs with the nested array, the second one of type integer, and the final one gets combined with their string we created of the potion types and pairs with a hint of enum. Going to the editor, and because we introduced new enums, typically the scene needs to be restarted. After restarting the scene, we can see that the trained classes variable is there. We can choose our desired values. The potions bag variable can also be created, and we can add whatever potions we want into the arrays. At this point, we have more or less recreated what we had in our basic export script. And if that's all we could do with advanced exports, then we would kind of be wasting our time. But after all that setup, we can now expand upon what we made. We've already implemented some unique scripting, as we were able to have our potion integers represented by an enum. But let's take that further. What if we had a custom resource that we wanted to be able to use in a one-dimensional array? The implementation is actually quite simple. 
First, we create a custom resource and I'll add some basic information into it. Then we create an array and add it to the property list function. There are a few differences from the two dimensional array we created earlier. There will be only two percentage Ds now, pairing with a type of object and a hint of resource in the following array. The hint string will also have an addition, which will be the class name of the resource in quotes. So here it is spell resource. Now we can add elements to the newly created array and see that we only have the ability to add our specific custom resource. This is incredibly useful to back a lot of potentially different information into the inspector. Resources can also be nested for even further depth. Another thing we can do is add conditionals into the script to modify things like variables or what the inspector displays. First, let's add a simple set function to the team name variable that checks the name and changes the team color to match. Once the function has been created, we can test it and see that the color gets automatically updated. Let's add a conditional now to the property list function itself, where the wizard spell will only display if the trained classes integer has the wizard bit flag flipped. A quick note, as I didn't realize this until after I'd gotten to this point, but a bit flag exported variable does not check the values of the enum that it's referencing using the method that we've gone through here. So even though the wizard enum value is set to two in the script, when ticking that value in the inspector, it is setting the trained classes equal to one. This issue is also relevant if the typed enum is out of order. We can fix this by adding another value in the enum that is equal to one and setting it before the wizard value. Since we're checking the integer for specific bits that have been flipped, we need to do a bitwise and operation using the trained classes variable and the wizard enum value. If that conditional is true, then we will add the wizard spell subgroup to the array. Going to the inspector and checking to see if it worked though, when we flip the wizard flag, it doesn't change anything. That's because the get property list function only runs automatically if the script is reloaded by the editor. If we want to manually run it again, we need to use the notify property list changed function somewhere relevant. So let's add another set function that just sets the trained classes variable and then runs the notify property list changed function. Now, when we tick the wizard flag, it properly updates the inspector. Keep in mind though, this is only changing what's shown. For most variant types, what is stored inside of the actual variable will not change whether or not it's displayed on the inspector. Now I'm going to go over some scripting styles and methods that work well for me when paired with advanced exports. You may find other methodology works better for you, so you're welcome to try my methods or develop your own. I personally prefer to get my main node scripts, not tool scripts. Running every component node script all the time in the editor can cause potential slowdowns, more frequent program crashes, and more difficulty debugging things in the editor versus at runtime. An easy way to separate the tool scripts from the main scripts is to simply create resources that are tool scripts, then embed them into regular scripts as variables. So. We can just copy everything that we've written so far and paste it into a new script and give it a class name and have it extend resource. Then in the parent node script, we just create a new regular export variable that is of that class type. There are downsides, however. Categories will no longer work as the resource cannot be split into categories. A workaround for this is to simply use nested resources in place of them. Another issue is that the process function does not run in a tool script that extends resource, only in a script that extends node. We haven't needed to use the process function yet, but when I go over visualizers, it will be necessary. Using custom resources, however, does offer a very compact and efficient way to move information between nodes, as emitted signals or called functions simply need to contain a single variable of that resource type and any updates to that resource do not disturb the function calls. As an example, let's create a simple node that takes in the new resource and prints the team name. 
In the parent node, we simply need to access that child node and call that function on ready. Running the scene, we see the printed team name is accurate. Now let's go over visualizers. While using the tool resource method does keep the tool scripts compartmentalized from the main scene scripts, it has an undesirable side effect. Without opening the scene and editing the children directly, we can no longer see things like collision shapes in the editor. This can make it difficult to ensure shapes and other things are the right sizes, so I created what I call visualizers. A visualizer is simply a child node that is also running a tool script. It has to be a node rather than a resource, because as I mentioned earlier, resources don't run the process function in the editor, even when they're a tool script. To demonstrate a visualizer, let's add one more variable for shape 2D. When adding the shape to the property list function, its type is of object, and its hint is of resource type, and the hint string is shape 2D. Now, we add another child to the main node and attach a script. First, we need to get access to the parent node, as the parent node itself is not running in the editor. Then, we add variables for the collision shape we will be adding and the resource that we created. We'll add a simple function that checks how many children the visualizer currently has, and if it's less than the amount that we expect, it will add a child collision shape. Then we update the shape information for that collision shape. Next, we add the process function. In order to differentiate between what is run in the editor and what is run at runtime, we can use the editor is hint condition. If we want code that is only to be completed at runtime, we can do the inverse of that if statement. Next, we check that the parent node variable is valid. Otherwise, we will get a noisy error while that variable is null. That error can very quickly fill up our output log in the editor. Finally, if both are true, then we set our custom resource variable equal to the parent node's resource variable and run the update shape function. Restarting the scene, we can now see the visualizer has created a collision shape that matches the one that we set in the custom resource. Now, we can instantiate this scene into another scene and, ensuring the resource is unique so that we can edit it, update the shape, and see it change in real time, all without editing any children. You can do more than just add collision shapes depending on your needs. For things like a cone or donut shape, I use the draw function which is explained in the Godot docs. And there you have it. This is my methodology for keeping my scene trees clean when using my reusable component nodes, all while having fully customizable information in the inspector and still maintain visible things like shapes in the editor. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this helped and I wish you the best in your coding adventures.